Once again to Rasmussen College Recorded Lectures for Maternal Child Health, which is NUR2633 here in Florida. My name is Lynn Whitmer. I'm one of the Rasmussen full-time instructors. I'm also a nurse midwife and am presenting this Module 6, Growth and Development, to you. Please recognize that growth and development is the concept. All right, and what we're going to be doing this with this module is just talking about an overview of what you need to recognize in the pediatric or the little person so that we can then learn to communicate, interact, and pe be prepared to how to manage someone who's outside of what the normal response should be. What I've asked you to do is look at multiple chapters. I'm not asking you to read each of the chapters in depth. I'm asking you to overview them. So let's look at chapter 20 completely because that does talk specifically about growth and development. And then within chapters 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, and 28, only the beginning few pages which gives you an idea of the anatomy and physiology and what is different about pediatric um, system development then from adult system development so you can recognize and be prepared for when these sick um, children come to your uh, units, your medical surgical units, your emergency department, and even in your trauma department. First of all, let's begin with some theorists. There are multiple theorists out there who have written volumes of books on growth and development or childhood development. Freud, of course, is kind of in the psychosexual aspect of things and he outlines children's normal growth and what it should be and what is the normal response in a sexual manner. Piaget looked at the cognitive development. What is happening to the brain? They go from very simple to complex thoughts and concepts and those have been outlined and they can be lined up with chronological age to some degree and when you find that a child is outside what the norm of development should be, we want to recognize it early enough so that we can intervene. Kohlberg is on the moral and spiritual aspect, and again, this is outlined both chronologically and, and cognitively, and when we see a child that's outside of that, we want to try to identify what has caused the child to fall outside that developmental realm. The one that you'll need to focus on most specifically and really get to know, almost to the point of memorization, is Dr. Eric Erickson when he's talking about the developmental theories. In this, he's looking at the influences of family and the social interaction of children and how they respond. You have been um, introduced to Dr. Erickson in other courses, and now we're going to look at it in a little more in-depth. So if you would go to that, go to your Erickson's and really get to know his five, there are eight developmental stages, but you need to be focusing on the first five because this is a pediatric course and those are the first five that you'll need to uh, focus on and we're going to talk a little bit about that too. There's a lot of other theorists that are mentioned in your textbook and I would peruse them very briefly, but do not get hung up too much on any of them other than Dr. Erickson right now. The other thing I want you to think about, and I know you um, will recognize Purnell's cultural concept model. That was introduced to you in both the Intro to Professional Nursing and your Critical Thinking course when we talked about ethics and law. Purnell came up with a conceptual model that you were to look at yourself, and I think there are 12 aspects of his model, and those 12 points of view come into making up who you are. And we need to keep that in mind when we're dealing with patients of any age or any co cognitive or developmental um, delays because that helps us understand a little bit of who they are and why they respond the way they do. This is what makes nursing unique. It makes it interesting. It makes it challenging because it's not the same. If we were all the same, came from the same background, the same cultural view, it would get very, very boring. But since we all have so many different things that our families bring to us, it's where we're placed in the family, who we felt had the most influence on us, how did our peers interact with us, who we chose as peers, what's our religious background, our spiritual background, what's our cultural background, what about the foods we eat or the foods we avoid because of family influence, what about our um, thoughts on physical care and the physicians or nurse practitioners that care for us, what about death and dying, what about their birth, 
Remember all of those things that you had to answer when you looked at yourself. And when you look at yourself, you recognize that you are multifaceted, you are multifocused. And there's a lot of things that have come to your life that make you react or respond. So hence we've got to keep that in mind and even ask some very pointed, precise, specific questions to our family so that we can recognize what some of the influences of these children are. And I don't mean to be labor of this, but I think it was very interesting and very necessary for us to recognize the holistic aspect of each individual we encounter and not get angry when they don't respond in the way we think they should. Dr. Erickson's theories are these five. These are the five that you will have to learn. The normal are to the left, and the abnormal or the non-response is to the, to the right. So we expect babies to be in the trust versus mistrust. And they are expecting that we respond to their care. They cry, they expect a response. When they do not get that response, if that happens repetitively, they will start to withdraw. Now, children will grow up. Physically, they will grow. Psychologically, they will grow. But developmentally, they may not. They may get stuck in that trust versus mistrust stage, meaning they may never have a very close personal, intimate relationship, and I'm not talking about physical intimacy, I'm talking emotionally intimate relationship where they never really trust anyone, and that's unfortunate. So if we can help, if we can recognize that stagnation or that lag, and then we can help the parents help move these children through or help the children move through. The key to pediatric care, also I want to say this right off the beginning, is it's about early recognition. Early recognition of either a psychological, physical, emotional challenge that we can intervene quickly. So the quicker you intervene, the better outcome or the better progress a child is going to make. So you can have a huge impact. Don't think that you're just there to give a pill and to start an IV and, and keep them in that bed and keep them safe. There's so much more to pediatric nursing than the obvious what you see care. So trust versus mistrust is that first developmental stage, and that is through year one. The second stage is from like 18 months to about three years of age, and that's autonomy versus shame and, shame and doubt. And if you think about a toddler, they're always trying to do things themselves. They want to master their environment. And when they cannot master something, they're going to have some shame and doubt. Or if we take away their ability or their opportunity to try to master something, they're going to have that shame and doubt. Never feel like they can do anything. Never do it right. Never do it fast enough. Never do it completely. And so they will quit attempting to do anything independently and they will become dependent and remain dependent. So autonomy versus shame and doubt. Autonomy for a toddler takes a long time and we have to be patient and oftentimes we're just not patient enough to allow them to complete it. Now I'm probably making this very simplistic and I don't mean to do that, but it helps you start framing the reference of where you're at. So if he's trying to put on his own shoes or put on his own shirt and button all the little buttons, um, we have to give him time to do that. It's also the time of the physical development where the bladder and bowel uh, control begins and so learning how to do that seamlessly, carefully, without a lot of shame and doubt associated will also help them progress through. Okay, so autonomy versus shame and doubt is the toddler. Then we go into this preschooler, which is the initiative versus guilt. They want to strike up on their own. They come up with new ideas. They're starting to move in from simple to a little more complex thought processes. They're recognizing that the world is not just about them and what they immediately see, but there is a world beyond what they can actually see and feel, and that their actions will have consequences on other people and other beings, other things such as animals, etc. So they're getting to a much more complex. So they're setting out, they're trying new things, they're trying different things, they're learning to conceptualize and if I put this together and this together, this is what the consequences should be. So the opposite then would be guilt. When they have not been successful in their initiative or if they have not been promoted, encouraged, they're always going to have a feeling of guilt. Then we move into the school age child, which is industry versus inferiority. Again, now they're mastering this. They want to put the work together. They want to be successful. They want to show you what they've done. I've written a, a play, or I've um, drawn this beautiful picture, or I've gotten an A in school, 
or I'm the star of the track team, or whatever it is, they have this need to be industrious work, show you the, the result of their activity. And when they are um, stagnated, squashed, put down, berated, said you could be better, or being compared with others, it will build an inferiority complex. And we laugh sometimes in class and say, oh, I have a little bit of an inferiority complex. It's real. This is a real problem, and we want to help promote that. So when we hear parents berating their children for very minor things or berating their children in their lack of ability to be successful or you got sick, and therefore now I have to take you and fix you, um, that doesn't help promote their self-esteem. So we want to recognize it and help them develop through this. And again, the very last is your adolescent from 12 to 18 years of age. Identity versus role confusion. And I don't think we need much explanation for you to recognize that teenagers are really trying to discover themselves, trying to find out who they are, what they're about, who they belong to. So they will form clubs or associate with different groups. And you hear all the different cliques or groups in schools and who's better, who's worse, how they fit, how they don't fit. So they're trying to find their own identity. But to do that, they do it through association with other groups. So you find some young women all trying to dress alike or compete. Um, you see uh, the guys all having to have certain um, industrial activities, or they all, I, I don't even know what cliques they all belong to now. But you have your secret societies and your secret groups and much more collective groups. And they move from being uh, singularly um, uh, single gender groups to co-ed gender groups as well as their sexuality starts to um, develop and they're identifying that there are differences in boys and girls and they and they start the hormones start to peak and they start to recognize the attraction okay and, and a different attraction be it a same sex or a heterosexual they start to identify a different type of attraction a much more sexual attraction than just a, hey I like hanging out with you type thing okay so those are the five theories that you will be focusing on for the for the remainder of this quarter Trust versus mistrust, autonomy versus shame and doubt, initiative versus guilt, industry versus inferiority, identity versus role confusion. And at any time during any of your work that we ask you for Erickson's theories, it should not only be the chronological theory, because we know that the first one is with infancy, then toddlerhood, then preschool, school age, and adolescence. So not only are they in that, but are they actually in that developmental status? station or have they had a stagnation or have they accelerated and moved a little bit faster through the developmental levels and you need to recognize that so that you can help formulate a plan of care. Growth and development now in the module there is a graph that is there for you to work on what you should do is um, probably download this into a another format either on your hard drive or in some type of a uh, thumb drive or external hard drive and start working on this and start building on it. And if you do this in groups of two or three people, it'll go much faster. You'll get a lot of information in a short period of time. It frees you up from actually having to read the textbook in depth. And it gives you all the information you'll need at your fingertips of these different, sta um, these different titles. We're looking at temperament. We're looking at physiological growth of each of those stages. Remember, there are five stages, infancy, toddler, preschool, school age, and adolescent. And each of those stages represent differences. And so I want you to recognize the differences in each of these categories. Um, temperament, I will say right now, is pretty stable. Temperament comes at birth. It is a genetic link. Now, we can influence temperament, but temperament is who the child is. Initially, we, we identified there were three types of temperament. In your textbook, there's multiple temperaments. You don't have to know them all specifically. Just know that there are differences in temperament, and those will come out at the base level, meaning if I get really, really scared, or if, I get, if I'm in a lot of pain, or if I'm under sedation, perhaps, those temperaments might rise. Now, there's the, the easy child, the slow to warm, and the difficult child. And we can influence their behavior by the way we interact with them. But it is a genetic link. We cannot change 
temperament. We can influence, but we cannot change what we were born with. Just like we cannot change the fact um, that I have uh, blue eyes, unless I wear contacts to change the color. But you cannot change what the base model is. Physiological growth, again, infancy, toddler, preschool, school age, and adolescents all have a different rate of growth and a different, um, not only rate, but establishment of growth. There are nutritional needs for each of those stages, and there are dental needs for each of those stages that you'll need to recognize and be able to speak to. Psychosocial growth. Again, we talked about Erickson's, but talk about the fact that children grow in a specific way. There's linear growth, okay? They start at the head and they work down. That's why we said babies, their heads are bigger than their body, and then their bodies catch up. By, the, by, by one and a half to two years of age, the head and the chest are the same dimension. But initially, the head is bigger than the chest, and the chest is very round in a baby, but then it becomes much more lateral. The rate of growth in infancy is is amazing. They double their weight at six months. They double their weight at six months. They will never do that at that rate again. And then they triple their weight at a year, which means it starts to slow. And as a toddler, they grow and they get they they gain weight, but it isn't at the same rate, and their height is not at the same rate. Once they hit about two and a half years of age, they're one half their adult height. So that's amazing. So though the growth rate has slowed, it is still pretty rapid until they get beyond toddlerhood, and then it definitely starts to slow until we hit adolescence. And then whoosh, we take off again. We skyrocket again. And we get to our adult height, usually about 16 to 18 years of age. Now, that's, that's the mean, but we know there's exceptions to that. We know some children that get taller after they turn 18 or 19 and they put on a little extra weight, or we know that these super athletes get a little taller perhaps later on. So, but understand that growth is linear. It's head to tail, middle to distal, and simple to complex. So our arms get stronger than our legs. We learn to crawl before we learn to walk. We say one-syllable sounds, and then we say multi-syllable words and multi-syllable sentences. OK, so I'm, I apologize for that little break there. We were talking about the linear growth of children. Remember, it's head to tail, so cephalic to caudal, cephalocaudal, center to distal, and simple to complex. All children grow at the same rate, and that's not true, not rate. They grow in the same way, but it's like stair steps. It's not a linear, I mean, it's not a nice, even line that everybody's going to meet these developmental um, growth patterns at the same time. We grow the same way, but we grow at different rates. And in some books, if you go and start doing some research, you will see that two, two young men, supposedly, will say, um, two, two boys, same age, but one is like six foot and the other one is four foot 11. So we don't, because there's so many things that go into our growth development. And nutrition is huge. Nutrition is probably the single most important factor in the development of children. And yet, we put that on the back burner whenever we talk about problems or illnesses. Nutrition is not the number one thing we bring up. So when we look at our history, data collection, and we've already talked about this, we always go into current illness and past medical illness, past surgical illness. We put nutrition at the bottom of the list, and really it should be at the top, and get a 24-hour recall from the parents, if at all possible, if the child is not a good historian. Dental needs are also important. We see way too many children with, that are not, they're not edentulous, meaning they, they have teeth, but they're rotting or they're not well cared for because the parents either don't want to fight with the kids to brush their teeth or they're in an area where there's not good fluorinated water and so they're not getting the fluoride support for the, the dentition. So you need to be talking about dental care and oral care with, with kids and families as well as, well as nutrition. So psychosocial growth, again, we've talked about the developmental stages and what we would expect to see. Cognitive development, again, 
are they meeting the milestones? Are they able to accomplish the tasks as well as understand the information? We have a public school system, um, and I'm not here to make any political statements about our public school system, but the system is there. There is testing that is done to help identify that the children are meeting the milestones. Language development, again, goes from very simple sounds to complex thoughts, complex words, complex sentences. Um, and that just does take time. Children, um, toddlers, of course, and then preschoolers, and some school-age children are very concrete thinkers. And so when we talk to them, we have are talking to them in manners in which they understand. You do not know the history behind them. You do not know their environmental influences and what they have experienced. So we, when we start talking about little bee stings or sticks or um, a certain position we're going to put them in, we don't want to be very descriptive. We want to be very concrete. Discipline. Discipline is supposed to be education. When we discipline children, is to keep them safe. So it's about safety and education. It's not supposed to be about power and control. And we're going to talk about those things, too, as we move through. And then some unique behaviors I put down there as well. Injury prevention, that's huge for children. Because again, they get into everything, see everything. And we have to remember where they're at in their milestones or where they're at in development, what type of injury prevention and how we approach it. Initially, it might be recognized as discipline. It's no, you cannot do this, or no, you cannot participate, or no, you cannot. And then as they get older, we can rationalize and educate them on how to stay safe using both equipment and reasonable activity. Sleep and activity, again, we don't want to um, gloss over that because sleep is very important for children. Babies sleep approximately 18 to 20 hours in a 24-hour period. As children get older, of course, that sleep requirement decreases, but there's still a requirement. And many parents, out of their own concern of quality time with their children, tend to allow the children to stay up later and later to mimic or adopt their um, sleep-wake cycle because of their work. And we can't do that. Children have to have more sleep. And so if we have to establish a specific bedtime, that's probably very appropriate so they get the amount of sleep or at least rest to do the work that they have to do because children's play, children's activities, children's school is really work for them. And for them to expand, and they expend more energy. So for them to be able to do that, we have to provide enough sleep time or rest periods for them. And then activity itself is work for kids, and they want to stay active. And that is also how they promote growth. That isn't how they grow, but it promotes growth, their activity. And activity is really your barometer for illness. Most children are active. They have different things they like or dislike, but when we see children's activities lagging, slowing down, they're not participative, we need, that's a red flag. And we need to identify or start researching why are these children not, ident uh, why are these children not being active or having fun or playing or, or um, getting involved with other kids. We need to identify that. If we look at each of our, gro each of our five groups of children, growth. Growth, there's lots of milestones. Like I said, they double their weight at six months and approximately triple their weight in one year. Then their growth pattern starts to slow. They play, um, remember they have very primitive reflexes initially. Um, children reach out. With their eyes, they can see an object, but when they reach, their hand is closed until about three months of age. And then their hand will open, and they will attempt to grab. Anything you put into an infant's hand, of course, they will grasp around it, and they will hold on to it until they relax that motion, and then the object drops. And they don't necessarily understand what's happened, but they know it, it, it's now occurred, and they no longer have the object. And because of their primitive reflexes and movement, they often can make a rattle, shake, or they can make something make noise. And if we do the motion repetitively enough, they will figure it out. So at three months of age, they're reaching, but they can't grasp. After three months of age, they can actually do a gross motor grasp with their hands. 
And it's about approximately nine months of age when they can do a small uh, pincer movement with their fingers and actually pick up like a noodle or a cracker or they can pick up um, pick up small little toys. But remember, most everything goes into their mouth initially, so we want to keep them safe. So they go from a gross motor development into a fine motor development. They can sit unaccompanied or un um, don't mean unaccompanied, unsupported at eight months of age. But prior to eight months of age, they're either leaning. Now at about five months of age, they can sit up if you're holding them or have a lot of support with them. And then at seven months, as long as they're leaning, they can sit themselves up and their back becomes less curved and they have more support and strength in their back muscles. And then at eight months of age, they can sit erect on their own. At five months of age, they can turn from their bellies to their backs. And at six months of age, from their back to their bellies. So that, again, is a huge milestone for them to actually manipulate their bodies in that position. Creeping and crawling anywhere from six months of age to eight months of age. They will stand unassisted, usually around um, 11 months of age, where they're actually pulling themselves up. Now, I know your children were better than that. They did it at a much earlier age. That's wonderful, but by the parameters. And please check me on my dates and my times. And then at 12 months of age, they should be walking. So those are some of the milestones that we should be looking for. And we find if we find a lag, or a lack of this activity at certain specific milestones, we need to investigate what's going on. Some second and third in the family children don't tend to walk as quickly because they don't need to. Somebody else is pulling them or holding on to them or carrying them because it's just easier. Some children don't speak as early as others. And again, because people are doing the talking for them. Little brother or little sister wants to talk for them, and so there's no need for them to talk, and they don't develop the, same, the language skills at the same rate. It isn't that it won't happen, but they just don't develop at the same rate. And some parents start to panic. This child's not the same as that. Well, number one, every child is going to grow at their own rate, but we know that it always happens in the same sequence. That's what I was trying to say earlier. Same sequence, but different rates. And again, language development, they start out with just making vocalizations, sounds, then repetitive sounds, such as mama, dada. But the one word they learn very rapidly is no. And that is the toddler's favorite word is no. They will say no for everything. Even when they want to do something, they'll say no. Just because it's a cool word, they get a response out of you when they say no. They do a lot of mimicking. Uh, infants start to mimic behaviors. Eating, of course, we go from uh, breast or bottle feeding. We should breastfeed at least to six months. Longer is preferable, but if we start to wean, then we would offer formula, not whole milk or cow's milk that we buy at the grocery store. We still have to offer formula until one year of age. We do not feel that they have the enzymes or the digestive ability to break down cow's milk until one year of age. Dental care should begin around six months, where we're actually wiping out their mouth. The dental eruption should begin around six months of age. And as the, the teeth start to erupt through the gums, then we need to keep them clean. And if we are repetitive with our actions, every day it becomes a ritual to brush teeth, do oral care, then it won't be such an issue when their children are old enough to actually take on some of that responsibility themselves. Again, sleeping, most babies sleep. Um, they don't start sleeping through the night until about three to five, three to five months of age. And then um, they still continue to have to have some sleep time during the day, usually a morning nap and a little afternoon nap um, to kind of keep their growth and their activity levels. Injury prevention. MVA is probably the number one injury for all stages because we either don't put them in the restraints correctly, we don't use our car seats correctly, they're not secure in our car, and so motor vehicle accidents is usually number one injury. Then for babies, it's also about aspiration because they pick up everything and it goes into their mouth. And if it's larger than their um, esophagus or trachea, of course, they're going to, or it's smaller than their trachea, then they're going to um, inhale or aspirate. We tend to want to feed our children foods that they're not able to really um, digest yet, such as hot dogs, popcorn, 
um, some big noodles, some big vegetables that they can't quite chew yet. So aspiration from some of our foods or choking hazard is the other big issue. Small toys. And again, you should be filling these out as we go. Or as you're reading things in your textbook. Toddlers, again, their growth now slows. They lose some of that Buddha belly, that fat belly that they've had, and they start to slim out. Their legs go from being bowed to straighter. They're able to go from walking to running. Toddlers are negative, and they need ritual. This is how they learn to adjust to their environment. They're now learning that they are no longer the only person in existence. There are other people. In fact, when we go back to infant just for a moment, we did not speak about separation anxiety. Separation anxiety begins at about six months of age when babies start recognizing that mom is not attached to them. And they haven't figured out quite yet that when mom is not in my eyesight, that she's still around. So until they develop that object permanence, it's another great milestone, object permanence. You can hide something and they know it still exists. But that takes them until about nine months of age. So separation anxiety from about six months of age up to about 18 months or longer, depending on their security or their feeling that they can be independent. Toddlers are trying to get a little more independent. They start to move away from the parents a little bit more, but they always look back to see where you're at. So they will toddle away, and that's what we expect them to do, and I think that's why we call them toddlers. And again, they're still learning to walk and run, so they kind of toddle. They play. They're now building blocks. Um, they're starting to run. They're starting to use um, um, devices that they can motor themselves with a little bit, either with pushing with their legs or pedaling a little bit, so little tricycles. Language, they're able to put words together to form sentences now, and they understand what the sentences mean. You can still spell in front of your children. Eating and dental, they should be eating more of the foods that the adults are eating, and they can digest most of the foods now that are put in front of them. They're able to break down fats and proteins. Uh, dental care, a lot of their teeth have erupted at this point, and so we should be providing some dental care. It has been suggested in textbooks that we need to have their first dental exam at six months of age, but when you call a dentist, they will tell you they would prefer that the child is a couple years old, I believe, so that they can get them to participate and actually sit in the chair. Sleeping and activity, again, they might be moving from a crib to a full bed, so safety is an issue. Activity, again, much more active. Uh, babies and toddler, babies, infants, stay in one place where they start to roll or they start to motor themselves a little bit, but toddlers are always on the go. They want to be in motion. So injury prevention is from falls, again, aspiration. Motor vehicle accidents, again, because we do not restrain our children in our vehicles correctly or on tricycles if they get out into the street. So now um, we, have to, we have to meet safety by discipline. No, you can't cross the street alone. No, you don't go after the ball. No, you don't go to the playground alone. No, you can't um, go with your friends or whatever. It's about it, discipline becomes a safety issue. Moving on to preschool, these children are a little bit older, obviously, anywhere from three to five years of age. They're thinner. They're uh, taller. They're much more active. They're much more uh, agile. They have a few more concepts. They're able to mimic the adults now. In fact, they want to mimic, mimic your behavior. They want to do what you do. So this is a great time to teach children some household chores. They can help with the dishes. They can help pick up. They can help with the um, sweeping, perhaps. Um, they love to be out in the yard with dad. But also, they like to watch other things, such as grilling and on the stove. So they want to mimic what you're doing. So you have to keep your children safe from grills, stoves. Uh, showers, bathtubs, because they can fall and injure themselves. They're very active. Discipline still is a safety manner. We still have to keep them close. We can try explaining the consequences of their behavior, but oftentimes they do not have a memory. Language development now, they should be speaking in short sentences. They may start reading very brief uh, one or two words. Uh, again, eating, they should be eating the full diet that you're eating. And we want to limit the amount of sweets so that we can prevent some childhood obesity. And we want to offer healthy snacks at this time and introduce them to healthy snacks. Dental care also is important. Sleeping and activity, no different. And injury prevention, again, we have to keep, this is when the drownings happen. Uh, 
the motor vehicle where they're getting hit on their bicycles sports injuries, we start getting some of the children into some team activities, competitive team activities, and so if they're not using the proper equipment, they can get injured, and we have to have coaches and parents that are really going to be cognizant of the type of injuries that they're sustaining and not ask them to play through the injuries. School age, again, much older. They're wanting to demonstrate what they can do now so things become more competitive. Their growth is still at a, a moderate but consistent growth. We don't see a huge growth spurt at this point. Behavior, um, again, their environment, they'll become much more independent. Peers are starting to become very necessary to them. Their play is a much more competitive, associative play, organized play. And discipline, now we can rationalize and talk to them about consequences of their choices and help them learn how to make those choices instead of being demonstrative. Language, they should be able to speak uh, clearly, um, very distinctly, and use multi um, syllable words as well as stringing large sentences together. Eating and dental, of course, are eating everything we are. In fact, we have to help them make the choices because in school now they'll have choices with lunches. Dental care is, is definitely, this is when dental caries becomes a problem and they start losing their teeth. Remember, they lose their first, they lose their front teeth and that could be in the preschool as well. The older preschool or the younger school age, they lose their two front teeth and then they start losing all their uh, initial teeth into their permanent teeth. And so we really do want to encourage dental hygiene and to encourage, um, and this is probably also when we might look, be looking at um, braces and other orthodontic work. Sleeping and activity, <coughs> this is when children start to try to find a multiple reasons not to sleep. They're active, they need a drink, they have to go back to the bathroom. I mean, there's hundreds of reasons why kids will not go to sleep initially, but we have to be very cognizant of their need for the sleep for growth and development. Activities, much more organized activities. It isn't just, oh, I'm going to sit and play by myself now. They're more organized, more involved, more competitive, more injuries can happen with sports. We have to help parents choose the right sport for the, the child. We do not want to put them into a sport that's going to cause a lot of injuries or that they do not have the body habitus for. Okay, So helping them prevent injuries. Also motor vehicle accidents, again, are huge. Drowning accidents, diving accidents, um, firearms perhaps at this point, um, bicycles. Then we get to adolescents, which are kind of a group all on their own, aren't they? The growth rate is phenomenal. They do have a big burst of growth. They're also having the hormonal influence for the sexual characteristics now. Little girls develop their breasts, their hips become more round, both boys and girls develop their pubic growth. Um, the boys, the penile length extends and of course they're starting to have some responses to sexual behavior. Play is much more organized. It has a meaning to it. There are rules, responsibilities, and then there are awards usually. It's extremely competitive. Discipline, they're looking more to their peers than anyone else. Parents don't have the influence that they had before. So we as parents try to help them choose, if we can, the friends or peers that they hang out with. So discipline becomes more about withdrawal of activity, a withdrawal of a favored item than it is about uh, corporal punishment or um, timeouts. Those aren't really working anymore. Language, they should be at the full capacity of their language and concepts. Eating, of course, again, try to instill good eating habits and teaching them that activity is important to counterbalance their eating. Now again, they're having a growth spurt, so they are deficient in possibly calcium and iron, so we want to ensure that they're getting supplements or getting additional uh, calcium and iron in their diet. Dental care, we want to prevent dental caries, and again, this is when the orthodontal work is taking place. So there's the self-esteem issues with dental work. Sleeping, Activity, they still require sleep. They, they will tell you they don't need as much. And you will find that teens may sleep later in the mornings because they have not gotten the sleep at night that they need. And their activity, again, they need to remain active or we have a growing problem of childhood obesity. 
Oh, excuse me. And injury prevention, we're looking more at suicides. We're looking more at self-esteem issues. We're looking more at motor vehicle accidents because now they're driving themselves and they are risk takers. So diving, swimming, doing things alone, pushing the physical boundaries or limitations. So injury occurs in that respect. Now, in your chapter, chapter 20, there's a whole, there's multiple cognitive or psychological disorders. And I have listed them here, but I'm not going to spend any time on them. I, you can read through them. But it isn't something um, that we need to focus on 100%. You need to know that they're there, that they can become an issue, and that if this patient comes to you with any of these diagnoses, or behaviors, we need to be able to recognize it and let someone know. Suicide, I've always, I've already mentioned, um, it can be a problem at any, well, not at baby infancy or toddlers usually, but preschoolers are even contemplating, even though they don't have the conceptual ability to recognize what death means, um, there have been some questionable suicides and suicide packs very young, but it is in the school age and the adolescent that we really need to recognize the signs and parents need to recognize the signs um, to help prevent that tragedy. Reactive detachment disorders, again, I'll let you read a little bit about that, but it goes back to Erickson's theories. When we do not recognize a lag, that can cascade or become part of this issue as well. Failure to thrive, it can either be organic or non-organic. I have seen in the care of children, uh, failure to thrive where it's completely psychological. There was not an attachment made to the parents at, or any primary caregiver, and so they had no need to eat. And then I've seen the organic where they have hiatal hernias or a um, pyloric stenosis or some type of short bowel syndrome where they were not able to absorb the nutrition and they had failure to thrive based on an organic issue, not based on a psychological issue. But there are two kinds. And just like eating disorders, this has a multi-layered, multifaceted requirement treatment program. All right, so I'm going to let you read through those other issues. Maltreatment of children, again, we're going to address that in module 10. Not that you don't need to read it now. You can read it if you'd like. But we're really going to focus on child abuse and victims of um, mistreatment or maltreatment later on in when we hit module 10. That's when we're talking about the concept of advocacy. Miscellaneous, again, substance use and abuse. We see that in school age and adolescent children. We need to recognize it. We need to discuss it. We need to talk about it and let them know that we're aware that it's out there. And hopefully, we build a rapport on enough with our patients that they will share. Eating disorders, again, we need to recognize them. And then we need to help them. So we don't want to gloss over the fact that this child is obese or that this child is underweight. We want to talk about those things because it leads to malnutrition, which can lead to some organ damage. And we want to prevent that before it gets too big of a problem. In obesity, we know there's a rising development of type 2 diabetes in young children. There's also a rise in uh, hyperlipidemia and cholesterol issues. And children at very young ages are having cardiac disease and even MIs. Uh, well, myocardial infarction. So we, we want to try to prevent that. So when we recognize it, let's talk about it. And let's not just pretend it doesn't exist when we can actually see it. Sleep disorders. Children do at um, preschool. Maybe some toddlers, usually it's in the preschool that we have some sleep tears or nightmares. And we need to address that and be talking about that, because that can have some long-term effects if they're not sleeping well. Disabilities. Cognitive ranges anywhere from very mild to severe cognitive disabilities. We need to recognize that because that's going to change our approach. It's going to change our plan of care. Uh, parents may share those things with us, but we also want to provide the most optimum care to our patients for what they need. So when we're providing instructions or education or even just communication, we need to recognize where they sit cognitively developmentally as well as chronologically. If there are anomalies, we need to recognize that too. So just because a child has an anomaly, physical anomaly, does not mean that they have a cognitive link. Now, there are some that go together, but we need to recognize that and see that it's two separate 
things. And again, it's all about early recognition so that we can provide an intervention program to bring children to their optimum. We want children to be the most productive they can with the disability that they have. Physical disabilities, there's chronic and acute, of course. Chronic, children cope a little bit better. Acute, it is based on at the age that the acute disability occurred. If they are very young and they get severely burned and they have this horrific scarring, what we would see as horrific scarring, they're going to cope much better with the multiple care, the multiple physical therapy, the multiple limitations than if they're an adolescent that goes through a severe burn and all the psychological implications there. So please understand that chronically ill children cope better. Acutely ill children cope, but not as easily. And then there's a lot of other things that, based on hospitalization that we're going to talk about in the next module when we talk about the hospitalized child. The other thing about physical disabilities, um, Again, it depends on their age and how, how traumatic it is. A fractured femur will say, it's going to slow you down, but it's going to get better. An amputation is not only going to slow you down, it's not going to get better, but we can provide you with prosthesis. But what has that done to your psychological demeanor? And you, as the nurse, the healthcare team has a huge impact on that. And we have to ensure that we are very careful on how we approach that. We need to start with where the children are at. The other thing, too, is pain. Chronically ill children's pain perception is going to be so much different than an acutely ill child's pain perception. So we cannot compare the two. So you need to be aware of how long this issue has occurred. A young man with sickle cell disease who's an adolescent telling you very calmly that he needs his next Demerol injection where you think, well, he should be screaming in pain to be asking for that Demerol versus a child who has a minor laceration who's telling, or we'll go back to an abdominal surgery who's yelling and screaming for their Demerol and acting out and you say, oh, yes, this child really is in pain. So you have to look at the history and look at where they're coming from as well. Basically, a systems review, what I had encouraged you to do at this point is to go into each of the chapters that were outlined and look at the beginning few pages to get an idea of each of these systems. So when you're looking at the respiratory system, I want you to recognize that there are nuances to children versus the adults. So the respiratory system in children, the basic thing is that it is shorter and that it's immature and that it doesn't have as much bulk as the respiratory system of an adult. And so the gas exchange is taking place, just as it does in an adult, but with a little more difficulty, perhaps. Babies are nose breathers, abdominal breathers. They don't use the chest muscles as much because they're not mature yet. The epiglottis is a little floppier, so there's more risk for aspiration. The soft tissue of the respiratory system is much more malleable or pliable and so it's more prone to edema. It's more prone to infections and so it gets edematous or swollen which can include the respiratory system. The force of ventilation for children is a little greater than it is for adults and so we have to keep that in mind if ever we need to do CPR or provide anything. And again, because they're more prone to infections, the respiratory system is a great medium for infection. So children tend to have more upper respiratory infections or more problems with asthma because we say children grow out of their asthma. It's because their respiratory system matures and they're able to cope with those changes that they weren't able to cope with as babies. Gastrointestinal, we know it's all about growth and development through the GI system. It's all about the absorption of nutrients. It's all about digestion, getting the food in and getting it to the proper place. And so if there's an anomaly or an interruption of that GI system or a change in the enzyme development, it's going to have a huge impact not only on our eating, but on our growth and development. If we have problems with any part of our bowel system, dehydration, I'm sorry, not dehydration, diarrhea where the food is moving through very rapidly, we have a poor water absorption, we have a poor nutrient absorption because of a disease process, we will not have growth and development. If we're not eating the proper foods, we're not introducing them to the high vitamins and minerals and the calciums and the irons and the protein, the protein for growth, 
they will not grow appropriately. So we don't want to call it to the point of malnutrition because they're growing, but it is a malnutrition to the body cells. So the GI system indeed is important. And there are only some foods that will be absorbed initially with infants, and we need to be cognizant of that. So when the parents are telling us, oh, yes, I give my baby mashed potatoes and I give my baby um, cereal already at three months of age, it's not doing them any good. They're not absorbing it. In fact, it might be causing more problems then it's helping, and we want to caution them about those things. Immunologically, again, um, the, immuno, the immune system is there. It's just that it's not well developed, and the defense system does not recognize the foreign substances yet, and hence they get sicker faster and more acute. Where we, get in t we meet a germ, and we say, hey, germ, come on in and I'll destroy you. Kids, they meet a germ, and that germ may duplicate and replicate very rapidly and cause them to be very ill uh, a little faster. So their immune response, though it is there, just isn't as quick to respond, hence they get sicker faster. So good hand washing is essential, and we need to be teaching children good hand washing because, again, what goes into everything that they pick up or get a hold of it goes into their mouth. We're also teaching children to share. Part of their Psycho social development is learning to share, learning that it isn't just about them. And so sharing, we give everything we share. So the germs, the parasites, the bugs, everything gets shared. So we need to be aware of that and teach parents about that as well. And the one thing everybody wigs out about is uh, lice. But most children, uh, I shouldn't say most children, a lot of children encounter lice, head lice, and it is no discriminator of uh, uh, poor or rich. The rich kids get it as easily as the poor kids. Okay. Cardiovascular, again, you have to recognize what the normal anatomy of the heart is and the vessels and the gas exchange and the circulatory system before you can recognize that there are any differences. The one thing that your textbook is going to talk about in depth is the congenital heart diseases. And those defects are either cyanotic or acyanotic defects. You need to recognize why cyanotic versus acyanotic, what has been happening. I do not expect you to memorize the different defects, but I do need you to understand that if you have a cyanotic problem, how is the child going to present and what do you think it might be versus an acyanotic presentation and what do you think it is and how do you manage it? Usually in all those cases, we're going to manage by oxygenation and rest. Respiratory, by the way, we're going to manage with rest and fluids. Uh, gastrointestinal, rest, fluids. Immunological, rest, fluids, and identifying what it is that is causing the illness. Cardiovascular, again, rest, fluids, oxygen. And then when you get to the endocrine, you know that's all about hormones, it's all about the different organs speaking to each other, so it's all about growth and development. It's about energy use and energy stores and where it goes and who has it and who doesn't. And so you need to recognize how the endocrine system works, what its influence in the growth and development of children is, and then later on in the next module we're going to go through some of the abnormalities and uh, focus a little bit more on how that influences children. Now, none of these things should be new to you. This is no different than your medical surgical information you've already learned. Respiratory, GI, immunological, cardiovascular, endocrine. You have learned these systems. You understand the anatomy and physiology of these systems. And if you do not, please go back to your AMP books and read. Please go back to your med surge books and read, and then find what's different about the pediatric patient. Pediatric assessments, this module, we're also asking you to do a written assignment, which is going to be due Wednesday of week eight, at the latest. On a pediatric assessment, there are six different pediatric assessments. You've been broken into your six groups, and you will write on those. Please recognize that communication is key. You've got to be able to communicate with the pediatric patient. Each child comes to you with different baggage. I call it baggage. I can't ever think of any. Or environmental issues. Babies have separation anxiety. Toddlers are going to be hesitant. Preschoolers are going to size you up. School agers may welcome you in. And the adolescent is going to withdraw. So you're going to have to be very, show some initiative on how you're going to get these kids to communicate with you. I do not 
joke when I say it may take you the full 12 hours to be able to complete a physical assessment on your child because they're only going to let you in for so long or allow so many things. And you're going to have to find the unique way to communicate with each and every child that you meet because they all come with different standard. The key to communication is get to their level. Speak clearly. Don't shout at them, but speak clearly. Get their attention so that they know you're speaking to them. Use tactile communication. Touch them if they allow you, but gently, carefully. Use transitional objects. Bring toys with you or ha use something that they have that's a favorite of theirs. If you like children or don't like children, it doesn't matter. You should be able to communicate. The other thing is use words they understand. Don't use big medical jargon. Don't use technical terms. Simplify it. Make it very concrete. And as I mentioned earlier, if you say you're going to give a bee sting, they may have had an anaphylactic reaction from a bee sting last time. So you just blew it. So you be, pick and choose your words very, very carefully. And be honest. They can read your body language, and they're looking for that. Children are black and white. You don't have to play games with them necessarily. And I don't mean you don't play games with them, but you don't have to play mind games. They want to know up front. So be honest, and they'll sense it if you're not. Nutrition, again, I said, was the single most important influence in the growth and development of children. We want to provide nutritious food, enough dense foods to help hold them together without requiring, um, with, without causing obesity. So maybe frequent small meals, maybe more uh, or less meals, some snacking, but nutrition snacking. Putting sugar or non-sugar items in front of a child, they're always going to reach for the sugar. Now, we always want to give children choices, but we have to be careful what choices we give. So it's a fruit, you, you'd say banana or apple, not candy or apple, because they're going to choose the candy, obviously. Teaching nutrition at a young age, it'll stick with them a lot better than trying to teach them older. Getting them to be active to try to counteract the poor nutritional behavior may take a little time. We have to be patient. We have to set, set small, um, achievable goals instead of expecting something huge to happen. Activity, we want to ensure our children are active. Remember, I said their activity is their barometer. If they're not active, there's something wrong, either psychologically or physically wrong with them, and we need to identify that. Play. Play is extremely important to children. It is their work. It is their focus. And a lot of children, reg not regress, but some children are so focused on their play that they forget the normal um, um, hygienic needs. Toileting. That's why some children either soil themselves or wet themselves because they're so focused on their play. They don't eat because they're so focused on their play. They can't sleep because they've got to complete this bridge they're building. So play comes in many uh, dimensions. It, in, initially, it's a solitary play. And then it, where they can sit and play by themselves. Um, all by themselves. Toddlers are very good at that. Infants, of course, do that. And some toddlers do that. Toddlers can be in a room with other toddlers, and they're so focused on what they're doing that it doesn't matter what the rest of the world is doing unless you get into my territory. And then I will notice you. That's when we start having parallel play playing at the same rate with the same type of toy in the same place, but we're having no interaction with each other. That is called parallel play. Then we have associative play, where we need a group of people, but we don't have to have any rules. Associative play as um, sandbox. We're all going to build a town in the sandbox, but it doesn't matter who's building what. I'll build the country store. You build the firehouse. OK, or we're all going to build roads, but we don't necessarily have to have any rules to make the roads work. Just build the roads. And we all get along. We play in the sandbox together. Associative play. i got to have somebody with me to make this happen, but I don't have to have any rules or regulations. And then we have organized play. This is the board games. This is the competitive sports. We have to have organized play. We have to have rules. We have to have moderators or referees even to keep everything fair and equitable. So you can see there's lots of different types of play, solitary, parallel, associative, and an organized. And the one other play that I didn't mention is called onlooker play. And that's usually the spectator, 
Now that is fine in most inst instances, except that if that is the only type of play that the child embraces, that is solitary. Solitary and onlooker play, that should be a red flag. Children should start to interact with one another. In fact, oftentimes if you leave toddlers in a room, close the door, step outside and watch through some w windows or cameras, they will migrate together and they'll start communicating and they will start they will become best friends or worst enemies but they they associate with each other they communicate together they interact so it is unusual when a child always wants to be on the outside always wants to be on the outside always wants to be on the outside and that should be a red flag to you that is one of part of the autism spectrum that you need to be um, aware of discipline again discipline is supposed to be about education and safety we Discipline our children, first of all, to keep them safe so they don't get hurt or injured, and secondly, to help them learn about making choices so that they make safe, appropriate choices for themselves. Discipline may initiate with corporal punishment, which is never a good behavior because it teaches children that hitting is okay. So corporal punishment is a form of discipline, not a favored form. Timeout is another form of discipline, and as we read and research that, it's usually one minute per age that we have children sitting in a solitary area where they cannot interact with anything or anyone to teach them that this behavior is inappropriate. Yelling and screaming at children doesn't help. It, de it demoralizes, it degrades them, it pulls them down instead of building them up. And we're supposed to be building up people if we're educating them. Withdrawing tools, withdrawing items, withdrawing um, activities is another form of discipline. There's probably a couple other forms of discipline that I'm not thinking of right at the moment. So if you can think about them, put them down on your paper. So we have mentioned corporal punishment, yelling, timeouts, withdrawing. And again, it's supposed to be educational eventually. That's what discipline is about, not about power and control. And then safety. We've alluded to some safety items for all children. Every stage, every level of childhood has different focuses for safety. Oftentimes it is the motor vehicle accidents and motor vehicles that create the big portion of safety issues. But then as children start to grow, become more um, agile, more adept, more mobile, they move further and further away from the adult supervision and then safety becomes a, a problem. And then making sure that during sports that they're using the proper equipment and that they have the proper body type, body style, body build to participate in the sport that they're uh, asking to participate in. Communication I've already spoken to, nutrition, um, We've already spoken to nutrition, play and activity. We've st already spoken to discipline and safety. We've spoken to. You may have to go back to chapter four um, for the discipline. And when we're talking discipline, let's also talk about parental styles. There's authoritative, authoritarian, and laissez-faire. Authoritative is more the um, dictator style, I believe. Authoritarian. What did I say? Authoritative. I have it backwards. I'm sorry. Authoritarian, I believe, is the dictator. It's always my way. Authoritative is um, setting the rules, but it's a dem democratic form where we're still working together to find the best solution. And then the other parenting style is laissez-faire. They just don't really care. Um, they're hands-off parenting. Um, Overprotection tends to be kind of the laissez-faire sometimes, or the authoritative um, has to be my way because I'm trying to keep you safe. The key to children's growth is socialization as well as play, nutrition, all of those things are key. And if we're overprotective, we don't allow socialization and we certainly don't allow, allow a lot of play and activity because we're trying to keep our children safe. We have to help parents realize that children have to socialize, regardless of their illness, regardless of their disabilities, they have to socialize. They may have to find like-kind disabilities where they're comfortable, or they have to help others recognize and adapt to their limitations, and that's okay too. But to isolate children, to protect them, is going to cause more of a problem for their developmental milestones 
then it will help them. So it's going to impede that. So when we're talking about discipline, I wanted to also mention parenting. And that's in chapter four of your textbook. So you'll have to go back and look at those things to prepare for that discussion. In your module, I brought up three, I think it's three critical thinking questions. I would like you to um, look at those, be able to respond to those, and if not in clinical, perhaps in our study halls on the weekend. If there are any questions after you have listened to this, I would like, I would suggest that you write them down or have jotted them down throughout the PowerPoint and submit those questions to me. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope this was helpful for you. Module 6, the overview of growth and development.